Okay, sto stoichiometry. Um, reaction stoichiometry allows us to identify how much carbon dioxide is released when a given mass of, of um, octane is burned. So the exact relationships are pretty complicated, um, but we can give an overall representative equation, and that's what we've got here. What this equation tells us is that 16 molecules of CO2 are released into the air for every two molecules of octane that are burned. We just learned about balanced chemical equations, right? This is a balanced chemical equation. So we can interpret these in terms of numbers of molecules. We can also interpret this equation in terms of moles of molecules. Just like if you were making pancakes and the recipe called for um, two eggs, right? If you were going to make a dozen recipes, how many dozen eggs would you need? Two dozen, right? Because it's just a counting unit. So if you have the relationship between individual numbers and you throw dozen or mole in there, the relationship is the same. So we had 16 moles of carbon dioxide for every two moles of octane burned. The coefficients in the chemical reaction specify the relative amounts. Those amounts are specified in moles of the substance, not in grams, in moles, because this describes how individual particles are reacting together. Any questions? So the amount of each reactant, you can have two reactants, you can have more, you can have just one reactant. The amount of each reactant is related to the amount of each product and other reactant. They are all interrelated. And this goes back to uh, the law of conservation of mass. We cannot have atoms being created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. They just get rearranged. And so when we're balancing the equation, we balance it by balancing the numbers of atoms. When we study the relationship between chemical quantities in terms of numerical quantities, it's called stoichiometry. So you'll see this word come up a lot, stoichiometry. It's looking at the relationship of quantities of substance in a chemical reaction. So let's think about making pizza. Hope you guys had breakfast. Um, the thing about making pizza, the number of pizzas you can make depends on how much stuff you have, right? If you don't have any ingredients, you can't make pizza. So here's a very simple recipe for pizza. One crust, five ounces of sauce, two cups of cheese will give you one pizza. It's a cheese pizza, but hey, it's a pizza. We can express the um, relationships mathematically as a ratio. One crust to five ounces of sauce to two cups of cheese to one pizza. And we can use those ratios to figure out, well, if we had 10 cups of cheese, how many pizzas could we make? Now, the math here is very simple, and that's intentional. Yes, you can just figure out, well, if I have two cups of cheese, I mean, 10 cups of cheese, I could make five pizzas, right? We can just think about that and get it. What I'm trying to teach you here is how to use the numbers in the relationship to make conversion factors. Okay, because we're, we're very quickly going to jump into things that you're not going to be able to reason out in your head. So please play along and try to write down the, the, uh, the factors. So how would we do this? How would we calculate how many pizzas? Well, we can think of this as dimensional analysis because that's what it is. So we've got 10 cups of cheese, and we want to know how many pizzas we can get. So we can do this in one step. So we start with our 10 cups of cheese. And dimensional analysis says, well, we want to multiply by the number of pizzas and divide by the cups of cheese. OK with that? Because then our units are going to work out. The recipe, or the chemical equation, gives us the relationship. Um, it takes two cups of cheese to make one pizza. That's a conversion factor. 
two cups of cheese per pizza, right? Or one pizza per two cups of cheese. So I've got my units in here already. I'm just going to look in the equation and look for the coefficients. One pizza, so that's on top, one pizza from two cups of cheese. And, you know, we did this math in our head earlier, but that'll give us five pizzas. What's important is that you understand how I wrote this out. Does anybody have any questions about that? We can use the ratios of coefficients in a balanced chemical reaction in the same way, just like we did with the cheese. <coughs> the conversion factors um, can relate any two reactants or products. So in the pizza example, we had a reactant and a product being related, but you can also relate two reactants or two products, any combination. You don't have to start with the first one and go all the way through to the last one. You just pick the two that you need. So it's, it's actually quite efficient. Let's do a chemistry example. So back to the greenhouse gas. If we burn 22 moles of C8H18, this is octane. So at the end of our last lecture, we talked about very simple organic nomenclature. Do you recognize why that could be octane? It's got eight carbons. It's just carbons and hydrogens. There's eight carbons, and so it's octane because oct is the prefix for eight. Burning 22 moles of octane, how many moles of carbon dioxide can we make? So we're, we're using this balanced chemical equation, right? And the equation tells us that two moles of octane would give us 16 moles of carbon dioxide. I like to use the balanced chemical equation to organize the information. Here it's pretty simple, but it's good practice. So 22 moles of octane. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write that under the symbol for octane in the formula. So I've got 22.0 moles of that. The, the, the problem told me that. And then I'm going to put a question mark under the thing I'm looking for. So I'm trying to find out how many moles of CO2. So I'm going to do a question mark here. That helps me to identify where am I starting, where am I ending. So my path then is 22 moles of C8H18 directly to moles of CO2. So I can convert this to moles of CO2, multiply by that, and divide by moles of C8H18. This is dimensional analysis that we learned a couple weeks ago. Anybody have any questions? So we stick those units in there. The numbers are the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. Two moles of octane to 16 moles of CO2. So in front of CO2, I put 16. In front of C8H18, I put 2. There's very little thinking here involved. It's following a pattern. Right? We learn the pattern, and then we can follow it. That's one of the things I like about math, at least you know, until you get into crazy stuff. You learn the pattern, and then you can do all kinds of problems. So common question, should I simplify this? You can, but I don't, I don't see the point. Sometimes when we do a simplification like that in our heads, we screw up. And, um, I mean, I'm all for practicing your mental math skills, but I'm also um, more in favor of getting the correct answer. Um, so use the calculator. So 22 times 16 divided by 2, 176 moles of CO2. Any questions? We got to we got to understand this part before we go on. So if you don't if you're not quite there, ask a question. Okay. 
So that's great, the mole-to-mole -mole thing. But we don't measure amounts of octane or amounts of CO2 in moles, right? We can't count individual atoms. We measure them using mass. And then we know relationships, the molar mass, so that we can figure out how many there are in a given mass. <coughs> These ratios from the balanced chemical equation only apply to moles, though. They don't apply to masses. So we're going to use this overall plan um, for stoichiometry. And we're going to use this um, all throughout the rest of the semester. So typically, you're given the mass of one substance. You convert it to moles using the molar mass. You convert from moles of that substance to moles of the substance you're trying to figure out using the mole ratio from the coefficients. And then you convert the moles to grams, to the mass that you're interested in. Okay, so here again, we've got moles in the middle. The moles are always in the middle. They're never on the ends. They're always in the middle. And um, a shorter way to remember this. Grams to moles to moles to grams. That's the path for most. <laughs> just, just waiting for the train. That's the path for most stoichiometry. And even when this is not the exact path we need, we're just going to modify this, OK? So grams to moles to moles to grams. You should just kind of chant that. And you know you've got it down when you wake up in the middle of the night mumbling, grams to moles to moles to grams, right? When you're dreaming about it, you've got it, OK? Grams to moles to moles to grams. That is the path that we're going to use. So here's an example. Lots of words up front, but we'll read them anyway. According to the US Department of Energy, the world burned 3.3 times 10 to the 10th barrels of petroleum in 2013, the equivalent of approximately 3.7 times 10 to the 15 gallons of gasoline. Calculate the mass of CO2 emitted into the atmosphere using the combustion of octane as the representative equation. So there we've got our equation, and then it says, compare the result. Um, Volcanoes produce about 2 times 10 to the 14 grams of carbon dioxide per year. So do you think that we are going to come up with an exact mass of CO2 that was emitted in 2013? No. These are very approximate numbers, right? There's a lot of estimation in here, and that's why there aren't very many significant figures. This is an estimate of how many barrels of petroleum. Not all of those barrels of petroleum were turned into gasoline. Some of them were turned into other things that were also burned. But it's equivalent to about this much gasoline. <coughs> so this will give us a ballpark idea, which is still useful. So what I want to do is I want to pull the important numbers out of here. Of course, the year 2013 is not going to come into the calculation. But then I've got um, grams of gasoline, and I have barrels of petroleum. The barrels of petroleum is just you know, kind of interesting, maybe, but it's not part of our calculation. Because that's equivalent to this much gasoline. And we are going to assume that the gasoline is all octane. And we're going to use this reaction. It's actually much more complicated than this. But this gives about the same answer as doing it the hard way. So this mass. I'm going to say is the mass of octane. So I'm going to write that under the, this formula here. So 3.7 times 10 to the 15th grams. And we're trying to find out how much CO2 in grams. So here I have a mass of one thing. I'm looking for a mass of another. What's the path? Grams to moles to moles to grams. 
right? And so I'm going to write it out a little more detailed for this first one. Grams, what is this thing we're starting with? It's the octane. So I'm going to start with grams of octane, and I'm going to convert to moles of octane, and then I'm going to convert to moles of CO2. That's the one we just learned how to do, and then I'm going to convert to grams of CO2. Because we have a reaction occurring and we're talking about two different substances, we need to specify grams of what, moles of what. If you leave the label off, you'll probably make mistakes and get incorrect answers. Okay, so there's my path. Um, I've got three arrows. I'm going to need three um, conversion factors. 3.7 times 10 to the 15 grams C8H18. Oops. Let's make that a little better. Okay, so times in a line, times in a line, times in a line. So the units there in my path are the units that go on top of these factors. Between the trains and the truck backing up, I might go crazy today. Then we put units in the denominator so that they're going to cancel out. We want moles of CO2 to cancel. We want moles of octane to cancel. And we want grams of octane to cancel. Get all the units in first, just following our path. And then we're going to put numbers in. So the first term relating moles and grams and the last term relating grams and moles, those are going to be molar masses and we have to calculate those. The middle term is the easy one because the mole ratio comes from the balanced chemical equation. I like to do the easy one first. It makes me feel better. So I've got moles of CO2 in the numerator and so in front of CO2 is the number 16. So I put 16 there. And I've got moles of C8H18 underneath, and there's two moles of that. <coughs> the unit tells me where to put the number. Now I need some molar masses. Um, so for C8H18, so I've got eight carbons and 18 hydrogens and I'm getting 114.224 and then I need the molar mass for CO2 which is one carbon and two oxygens So 44.01. And that's grams is equal to one mole of that substance. So for octane, um, the number 114 goes with the grams, because we know that one mole of octane, one mole is 114.224 grams. And the molar mass of CO2 goes in this last term. 44.01 grams of CO2 is equal to one mole of CO2. Any questions? Now we do the math. Go left to right, top to bottom. This times the top, divide by the bottom. Times the top, divide by the bottom. That will avoid um, some calculator communication errors.
and I'm thinking, um, how many significant figures should my result have? Two. Because my first number started with two significant figures. This is four. These are exact, and that's four. So as I write this down, I'm going to think about that. Two significant figures. I'm going to write down the next two digits just because that's what I do. And then times 10 to the 15. Depending on your calculator, the times 10 to the minus... 10 to the 15 may look different. Mine says E15 way at the end. Sometimes it's in little tiny letters. It's easy to overlook. Make sure that you record that, though, because leaving the 10 to the 15 off makes a huge difference, right? So this is grams of CO2. Any questions? Make sure that your calculator gives you the same answer. Yeah? I got a different number. Okay, what'd you get? 1.14 add some stuff times 10 to the 16. Yeah, that's what I got. Okay, I thought Okay, thank you. Because I'm looking back and um, I divided by 144 instead of 114. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, so this is why you do the calculation more than once. Um, there we go. Okay. So that's why I need you guys here because I do screw up on actually a pretty regular basis, unfortunately. I'm human. Uh, 1.140 times 10 to the 16. Better? Yeah. Because if you guys don't catch my mistakes, Somebody on YouTube will, like in three years, and they'll say, you, you did it wrong. So I need you guys to have my back. So if we were going to record that, we'd record uh, 1.1 times 10 to the 16 grams of CO2. And question asked, compare this to um, volcanoes. <coughs> well, 2 times 10 to the 14 grams of CO2 per year. So which one's giving off more? Gasoline. Yeah, combustion of, of petroleum products, right? 10 to the 16 is higher than 10 to the 14. I think on the next slide, yeah. So here are the results. So, you know, it's a little bit hard to look at those and, and really get a grasp for, is that a big difference or not? So let's find out how many times larger the petroleum production of CO2 is. So let's take the amount um, produced by petroleum combustion and divide it by the amount produced by volcanoes, which is also an estimate. Fifty-five. So the combustion of petroleum products accounts for 55 times more CO2 than volcanoes. So are volcanoes the problem? No, it does look like the increase in CO2 is related to human activity, right? Now, does this prove that burning petroleum is causing global warming? No, no. We're looking at where's the CO2 coming from. Any questions? Here's another one. <coughs> An example. Magnesium hydroxide, the active ingredient in milk of magnesia, neutralizes stomach acid, which is primarily HCl, according to this reaction. What mass of HCl in grams is neutralized by a dose of milk of magnesia containing 3.26 grams of magnesium hydroxide? So this is one of those word problems that a lot of students hate with a passion, right? So there's a bunch of words up here. A lot of times, that's just like backstory, right? It may or may not be interesting to you, but you don't actually need it to do the problem. This is the real question down here. You need the balanced chemical equation, and you need the question. So here we have some information, 3.26 grams of that. I'm going to use the balanced chemical equation to organize things. 
So I'm going to write 3.26 grams of that. And then the question, what mass of HCl in grams? So here's HCl. So this is what I want to find out, how much in grams. So now I've identified where I start, where I end up. And what's the path? Grams to moles to moles to grams. We're starting with grams, we're ending with grams, we have to do moles in the middle. Because that's the only relationship we have convenient to us that tells us how much of magnesium hydroxide, how much HCl. <coughs> so grams to moles to moles to grams. So I'm going to start with the thing I know something about, the grams of magnesium hydroxide. So grams of that to moles, to moles of the same thing, magnesium hydroxide. In each of these steps, we are only changing one thing. So in this first step, we're changing the unit on the quantity of magnesium hydroxide. Grams to moles to moles. This is moles of the second thing. Here we're going from moles of one thing to moles of another thing. The unit stays the same. The compound is different. And then the last step is grams to moles to moles to grams. Grams of HCl. Keeping the same compound, changing the unit. You can only change one thing at a time. So I've got my grams of magnesium hydroxide that I have a number for. Grams of magnesium hydroxide to moles of magnesium hydroxide. To moles of the thing they asked me about, HCl, to grams of HCl. I do not have to look at the water or the magnesium chloride at all. I just look at the two, the one I'm given a number for and the one I'm asked about. So then, just following our regular old pattern, we fill in the denominator so the units cancel out. And yes, it can be tedious writing those equations over and I mean those formulas over and over and over again. But getting the wrong answer is tedious as well when you fail the exam and then you fail the class and you have to take the whole stupid class over again. That's super tedious. This first term is going to be molar mass. Last term is going to be molar mass. Middle one is the easy one. What number should I put in front of each moles of HCl? Two. That's right up here. Two, we understand moles, two moles of HCl. What goes in front of moles of magnesium hydroxide? One. You could leave the one off like we did up here, or you can write the one. Either way is fine. We need some molar masses. <coughs> so HCl is going to be... 1.008 plus 35.45, so that's going to be 36.458 grams of HCl equals one mole. And then magnesium hydroxide, uh, magnesium 24.31. 24.31 is one magnesium. How many oxygens? Two. Because it's OH quantity two on the outside. So we have two oxygens and two hydrogens. And I really encourage you to write, write out what I'm writing on the screen. Because then um, you have a record of what you did. So adding that up, I get 58.326. <coughs> now we should always be thinking about significant figures, right? And what I am doing in lectures, I'm using molar masses that are rounded to four significant figures. And so I do the calculation 
My answer is going to have four significant figures. That's good enough. Um, I just leave the couple of extra digits there. There's never going to be more than a couple of them, and just just let them come along. So then I'm looking at my magnesium hydroxide term. One mole of magnesium hydroxide weighs 58.326 grams. And for the HCl, one mole weighs 36.458 grams. It's always one mole weighs how much, how many grams, right? So then you go through and you do the math, 3.28 divided by 58.326 times 2 times 36.458. You can multiply and divide by the ones if you feel better doing that. Um, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, well, this has three sig figs. This has four. That's exact. This has four. So 4.0754, so that would round to 4.08 grams of HCl. Okay. Any questions? So here's my view on significant figures. The point of this class is not to get really good at significant figures. Significant figures are not the end all be all of science. They're just um, a relatively simple tool to help us know how to round our numbers. Okay, so I've taught you them. You've been tested on them. On future exams, um, I won't trick you with sig figs, although there will be questions on the final exam about that. What I what I do want, though, is I want you to give it your best shot, okay? You know, my calculator here gave me 4.075475088. Don't write that down as your final answer. Most of those digits are just complete nonsense, right? Give it your best shot. <coughs> so if you're, really, if you're really bad at sig figs, I'll, I'll give you a hint here. A lot of these... Um, problems that you'll see in homework, on exams, in lecture, a lot of them start with numbers that have three significant figures, right? Guess what the answers end up having? Three significant figures. So if you really hate sig figs, go with three. Three or four usually works. Let's do another practice example. A component of acid rain, which we talked about at the end of the last chapter, is nitric acid. This forms when NO2 reacts with oxygen and water. This is a simplified equation, but describes what's going on. Um, the generation of the electricity used by a medium-sized home produces about 16 kilograms of NO2 per year, assuming there's adequate oxygen and water. What mass of nitric acid in kilograms can form from this amount of NO2. Okay, lots of words in there. Let's find the numbers. 16 kilograms of NO2. So I'm gonna write 16 kilograms here. And then the question. So usually involves a question word. Here's the question word, what? What mass of HNO3 in kilograms? So I'm looking for HNO3, question mark. The unit is specified as kilograms. <coughs> so what's the normal path for stoichiometry? Grams to moles to moles to grams. Okay, am I starting and ending with grams? I get kilograms. So there's a couple of different ways to approach this. You can add a term onto the beginning, 
You can convert kilograms to grams, and then you can convert grams back to kilograms. That's fine. Or you can convert the kilograms to grams before you even start with the equation. So if you understand the meaning of metric prefixes, you can convert a lot of these, maybe not nice enough for um, a master in chemistry question answer, but nice enough for a calculation just by putting in the math meaning of the prefix. So K stands for 10 to the what? 10 to the 3. So 16 kilograms is equal to 16. Instead of kilo, I'm writing times 10 to the 3 grams. You see that? Not proper scientific notation. Your calculator doesn't care. So let's do that. So we kind of did a, an easy conversion at the beginning. So we're starting with 16 times 10 to the third grams of nit um, NO2. Grams to moles to moles to grams. We'll worry about the kilograms later. So grams to moles, moles of NO2, to moles of what they asked me about, HNO3. to grams of what they asked me about. And like I said, we'll worry about fixing those units up later. So we're going to put grams of NO2 down there, and moles of NO2 down here. And moles of HNO3 down here. I don't know if the UT people can hear that. I love the fresh air, but good grief, that backing up truck is making me insane. <coughs> so let's do the moles to moles first. What number goes in front of HNO3? Four. And what number goes in front of NO2? Four. Well, why did I even bother putting that term in there? Well, you need to know the relationship. If you leave the term out, then things can go wrong. Just write it in there. You probably recognize that 4 over 4 is 1. So you can skip that in the math, but write it down there anyway. Don't, don't bother simplifying it. It's fine the way it is. Then we need some molar masses. We calculate molar masses a lot. So NO2 is going to be 14.01 plus 2 times 16, 46.01. So for the NO2, one mole is 46.01 grams. And for HNO3, we've got 1.008 for the hydrogen, 14.01 for the nitrogen, and we've got three oxygens. And I'm getting 63.018. Again, let me know right away when I mess up. Not if, but when. So for nitric acid, one mole weighs 63.018 grams. Any questions? So I could do this calculation. I'm going to do 16 EE3. You really do need to get um, familiar with the scientific notation button on your calculator. I'm going to divide by 46.01. If you want to multiply by 1, that's fine. Um, I'm going to skip the 4 divided by 4 because that's what I usually do. But if you multiply by 4 and divide by 4, it's going to be fine. You're going to get the same answer times 63.018. And this is giving me a large number. Right? So 
2191415402. Wow, look at all those digits. And that's grams. <coughs> How many significant figures should it have? Two. So that's the two, and the next digit is the one. Is this 22 grams? No. This is 22,000 grams, right? And speaking of units, is gram the correct unit? No, we're supposed to have kilograms. So let's convert that right here. So I want kilograms. I want to get rid of grams. So kilo means 10 to the 3. One kilogram is 1 times 10 to the 3rd grams. Putting the 10 to the something on the wrong side is a very common problem and it, it messes you up. I've got 1B students that are still doing this. So I'm going to take my number that I've got here and I'm going to divide by 1, E, E, 3. Yeah, I did something wrong. Syntax error. Yeah, I pressed minus instead of 3. Okay, so this is giving me 21.91 blah, blah, blah kilograms. And I can round this to 22 kilograms. If you are expressing this in uh, grams, you should use scientific notation. You could write 22,000, but 22.2 2 times 10 to the 4 would be better. But there's my kilogram answer. Any questions? Um, it's always a good idea to check that it's balanced. So what, what do they mean by this simplified equation? Um, scientists like to be precise. And so when we say stuff, we often qualify it, right? So this is the overall reaction for this, I mean, equation for this reaction, but it's actually more complicated than that. Um, but we've simplified it because the rest of it doesn't matter. So that's a good question. Um, here, generally, we're, you know, I'm not out to get you. The book is not out to get you. Sometimes it feels like that, but really it isn't. If there are coefficients on the, um, in the equation, it's probably been balanced. If there aren't any coefficients, then you should definitely check it out. Um, and it never hurts to check that it's balanced, because sometimes mistakes happen. Any other questions? So this is kind of a, a bread and butter calculation in chemistry. This is like one we do all the time. Basic stoichiometry of mass of one thing to mass of another.